Hello and welcome to Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. Unleashed is produced by Umbrex, which connects you with the world's top independent management consultants. And I'm your host, Will Bachman. I'm particularly pleased to be here today with a guest that I've known well for a long time, my dad, Dr. William Henry Bachman, PhD. And dad, welcome to the show. Thank you. So let's see, we have been doing these oral history interviews now since February, once a week. Um, and d do you want to uh, play back, Dad, sort of just give a quick overview of the topics that we've covered so far? Sure. Uh, prior to uh, starting in February with the oral interviews, uh, I had begun, oh, a couple of years ago, writing short uh, two or three page uh, chapters uh, sort of memoirs, starting with my birth and little history of each of my mother and my father and where I lived and so forth. And then uh, in February, we picked up with uh, oral uh, histories, about an hour each, covering topics such as high school, uh, my time in the army, uh, some uh, graduate school uh, work, uh, a little bit of, uh, of my memories of you as a child. And uh, so here we are today uh, where, uh, as I understand it, you would like to uh, have me uh, talk about what happened after I retired from engineering. So uh, yeah, I'm can... ready to proceed and when, whenever you are. Yeah, and I'll say this has been like a really uh, nice thing to be doing during the whole uh, coronavirus epidemic. We started in February, uh, really before the coronavirus was kind of top of mind for me. Um, it was only kind of just by happenstance because I had been on your case to keep writing your chapters for your, your memoirs, but uh, you yes. sort of slowed down a little bit in the production of those. And then we thought, well, what if we just do these to, you know, just as a phone call and I'll record them like a podcast episode. Yes. And that's been, it's been really nice. So every Saturday morning, every Sunday morning, we get together at 8 a.m. And we do typically an hour call. Uh, we did, yeah, but to your point, we, I think we've done eight or nine sessions so far. We did elementary school as an hour. We did high school. We did college. Then we did your two years in the Army as one hour. We did grad school. We did one hour on you and mom and how you met and how you courted and got married. Uh, and then one on your early years at combustion engineering. Uh, and then we did one on your sort of second half of your career there, covered Three Mile Island. And then we, uh, I said, and, I think, and then we, like you said, we did one on my early years and, um, and my sister's early years. So, uh, yes, for, for... and we started even before you came back to uh, uh, the farm in Pennsylvania. Uh, so if we started in February, uh, we were doing it uh, while you were still in New York City, I believe. Yeah. And I was here in Pennsylvania. Uh, and and now since uh, March, you've been here at the farm uh, and uh, we've been continuing to do it. Yeah. So, uh, so great. So for uh, listeners that uh, don't uh, know your bio, you, you just give us sort of a one minute capsule bio on your professional career. So you got a PhD in nuclear engineering from Penn State University in the 60s. And then just just sort of give one minute on what you did at combustion engineering. Sure. Yes. Uh, uh, at, at, at Penn State, I, I uh, in the College of Science, I had a bachelor's degree in physics. Uh, after that, because of ROTC commitment, uh, I spent two years in the U.S. Army, uh, and uh, among other things, I was a field artillery officer in the eight-inch howitzers. Uh, when I was still in the Army, I applied for graduate school and received a uh, National Science Foundation fellowship for nuclear engineering. I came back to Penn State in the College of Engineering this time. Uh, achieved a PhD and uh, began work at a company called Combustion Engineering. I spent 28 years there, which is, as I understand it, unusual now 
for a person to spend their entire career at one company. Uh, halfway through that, well, actually about three quarters of the way through that 28 years, uh, combustion engineering was purchased, uh, became a part of a larger corporation uh, called Asea Brown Bavari, also known by the shorthand of ABB. And uh, then I retired, uh, an early retirement, actually. I was only 57, 56 years old uh, and uh, returned to our farm in Pennsylvania. I retired in 1997. And I've been here uh, with my wife and uh, now you uh, across the street since, uh, since that time. Uh, of course, you didn't come here until more recently. Uh, so that's a short career. Uh, I was a nuclear engineer uh, responsible for designing uh, certain aspects of nuclear power production reactors. And we built them all across the U.S. Uh, and uh, had very, and, and a few actually uh, in uh, foreign countries. We built some in uh, South Korea. So uh, that's a, a, a synopsis of the career. Okay. So PhD in nuclear engineering, designed nuclear fuel, and then you retired, moved back to Pennsylvania to this place that at uh, uh, the house actually where your wife was uh, was 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 raised. What? Um, tell me a little bit about your career post uh, retirement, and uh, and how you earned money for a number of years. Yes, yes. Well, um, it turns out that one of the first things uh, I did when we moved here from Connecticut back to the farm in Pennsylvania uh, was uh, got my tools out and uh, began work on a barn. Uh, and with your help, having just left uh, the Navy as a, a naval officer, uh, with your help, you and I built a 30 foot by 40 foot two story barn. Uh, the main function of that was to uh, uh, house uh, your sister's horse. Uh, the barn uh, now functions as a lot of things, including storage units for uh, various things. Uh, the horse uh, unfortunately died a couple of years ago. Uh, but uh, a after building the barn, I found that uh, I had. Uh, tools and was uh, uh, interested in doing something more with uh, additional with my life. And I decided to become a handyman. I set up a business called Bill the Handyman. I uh, printed up, uh, had Visa print, I think it was, uh, Vista print, uh, uh, print me up some uh, business cards. I put a couple of, I put an ad in the local paper and very shortly uh, started getting uh, calls for handyman work. The key to that, though, was uh, some an interior decorator called me out of the blue and asked me if I would help her uh, install window treatments in homes around the area. State College, Pennsylvania, which is where we are near. Uh, is a college town and uh, has a lot of people coming and going. And so uh, interior decorating and window treatments in particular was very popular. Uh, I started with that, uh, the, uh, um, an activity, and that expanded because uh, my business card, I would hand out to uh, uh, all the, uh, the customers for the interior decorating jobs and a number of them then would, would call me back later for things other than interior decorating. Uh, just a word about the business card, about the marketing side of it. Uh, I think it was very important to have a business card because with my name and, and, and phone number on it, a, a short uh, a couple of words about the kinds of things I did, um, uh, people would call me back. And I think it was an attractive business card because it said, uh, have drill will travel, which was a play on a very a 1950s 1960s TV show 
called Have Gun Will Travel. On the business on the little business card, it showed my little pistol grip uh, hand, uh, little uh, um, uh, cordless drill, a little Dewalt 12 volt drill, and Have Drill Will Travel. And uh, people like that, and uh, uh, I, I would get calls uh, continuously. Uh, I didn't work 40 hours a week at the job. I wasn't really doing the job uh, to uh, survive, but the money that came in allowed me to buy additional tools. Uh, so, uh, so the handyman business uh, became something that I, 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 I did up until the oh around 20 uh 2014 2015 uh in 2016 i suffered a hospitalization for uh vertigo and uh, my my inner ears were damaged and so i gave up uh most of the handyman work because i could no longer trust myself on ladders uh, and a lot of handyman work requires being on a ladder. So uh, since then, about the only handyman work I've done is around my own house or around uh, your house across the street from, from me here in uh, central Pennsylvania. So what types, of, uh, what types of jobs would you typically get as a handyman? Well, uh, initially, uh, with the uh, first interior decorator, it was uh, all window treatments. Uh, high-end window treatments, these window shades that would each, each window would be in the hundreds of dollars uh, for the material, for the, the product, um, such as these honeycomb type uh, pull-down window shades. We also put up uh, shutters, which look like the shutters on the outside of a house, except you put them on, on the inside of the house, wooden shutters. Uh, drapes we'd hang drapes and so forth and that was mostly through the interior decorator that interior decorator uh led to a few other interior decorators uh calling me i even worked for uh, a, a furniture store who needed uh things installed so after the inter after the window treatment business people started calling me for other things because i had left my business card with them and uh, things like hanging pictures uh, 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 assembling ready to assemble furniture that was kind of a, a a big part of it it was a lot of fun doing these kinds of things uh, it's always great if you have a little bit of a, a particular skill and you can be paid for employing that that particular skill if you enjoy doing it, and I did enjoy doing it. It's certainly a lot less stressful than uh, managing a group of people or being responsible for uh, a nuclear uh, reactor design. Uh, it's usually in and out within a few hours at a particular home, and you meet a lot of nice people uh, in the job. So I love being a handyman, and uh, uh, I now have a shed full of tools that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Did you tell people that uh, your background, that you're like Bill Handyman? Well, PhD you know, it's interesting. Uh, because it was uh, at, at, in the town of State College, which is where Penn State University is headquartered, uh, most of the people, you know, all of the people knew about Penn State. And I'd sort of, when I first, when we, when the decorator and I would first go into the home, uh, I would she, the decorator would introduce me as her as her installer, and I'd give them a short, a very short, like, oh yeah, I've, I've been to Penn State, uh, you know, took a PhD here and and graduated in 1969, and and we'd chat a little bit. Uh, I, at times, I thought about changing my business card from Bill the handyman to. Uh, Dr. Bill, the handyman or something, but I thought that would be a little too snobbish, and I, I never really pushed the PhD part, uh, but I think people uh, trusted me maybe because of the degree and having been at Penn State, and many people would actually uh, just 
if I showed up there for a particular job, uh, not not the interior decorator job, but a, a handyman job, would just give me the keys to their house and say uh, they've got to go shopping or something and go ahead and do this job and uh, leave the bill when you leave. So uh, uh, I, I found a lot of trust in the people and uh, it was a lot of fun. And uh, uh, yeah. And would you, uh, were there some jobs that you just, uh, like, so uh, you said picture hanging, what, what other sorts of things would people call you up for? Well, uh, occasionally uh, they'd have me, uh, <laughs> one of the simplest jobs was changing light bulbs. Uh, some people, well, actually, it's, it's a little fancier than that. Some people have lights up in the ceiling, uh, kind of floodlights, and they couldn't get up there with ladders and so forth. Uh, so when I found that that was uh, a thing that people needed done, I bought one of these extension poles with kind of a suction cup-like thing on the end of it that could uh, reach up and uh, twist the uh, light bulb and bring that out and put a new one in and so forth. So uh, picture hanging, light bulbs are ready to assemble furniture. Uh, those kinds of things, things people needed done at their house. Uh, I decided early on I wouldn't take any of the um, uh, rougher kind of jobs, you know, cleaning out basements or doing roofing work, that sort of thing. It was all nice, clean interior work uh, that only required a couple of simple tools, uh, a drill, hammer, screwdriver, uh, measuring tape, so forth. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, kinds of things that people needed. I did find that my customer base tended to be, uh, uh, I wouldn't say elderly woman, women, but certainly they, except for interior decorating, which often was young couples who needed window treatments, uh, the kinds of personal calls I got would have been from middle age to slightly older women who either were already uh, widowed or divorced or their husband was a professional in some sense and uh, didn't have time or skill to do the, the kinds of handyman jobs that uh, they hired me for. So my customer base tended to be mainly housewives uh, who needed something you know particular done around their house interior typically and uh what were you typically charging well uh funny thing about that uh i started off I, for me personally uh i've always done all the kinds of stuff around my own house uh except maybe uh i'd have a furnace guy come because i didn't want to uh mess up the settings of the furnace, but pretty much everything around my own house, painting and electrical and plumbing and so forth, I would do myself. So I really had no idea what what uh, people charged for this kind of work. So I started out with $25 an hour. I picked a number and I found that people didn't mind that. Uh, and over the years, I, every couple of years, I'd bump it up by $5. I think um, by the end of my uh, time as a, a handyman, I was up to the the forty five, maybe fifty dollars an hour, and I thought that was really high. But everybody was very happy to pay the fifty fifty dollars an hour to get things done in their house. I did at one point go to a, a local home show in the area and talk to a few people who had uh, booths there and they were in the, the 70 to a hundred dollar an hour range for handyman work. So I felt okay about that, that, uh, that I was finally up in the, the 40 to $50 range. Uh, Do you feel that you could have um, generated more work if you had wanted it? I mean, would or would you turn stuff away? Well, uh, for one thing, uh, I wasn't doing it to survive. Uh, mainly I was doing it to give me a little cash and an excuse to buy some additional tools such as drill press and bandsaw and a better table saw and so forth. So uh, I was 
living off my pension uh, from engineering work and uh, uh, social security. By the time I got to 65, I was still doing this work. Uh, and uh, so I didn't, it's not like I really needed the money and tried to optimize the amount uh, of funds I was getting out of it. Uh, uh, so. Uh, so how, how, how much do you figure someone could make if they really were trying to, uh, you know, make a, make a serious living out of it? What, what sounds like you could have probably had some upside on the prices that, that you hadn't really topped out on what the prices. Yeah. Could be. Well, you, you, uh, a, a, a typical uh, way of calculating these things, as you know, is to take uh, a 2,000 uh, hour uh, a year employment, 40 hours a week, 50 weeks. Uh, and if you take 2,000 and multiply it by even $25 an hour, you're into the $50,000 a year income category, which isn't too bad for a, a starter job. Uh, and if you bumped it up to 40 to $50, you'd be in the 80 to hundred thousand uh, dollar category. I had considered, but never really uh, took it too seriously. Uh, what it would be like to have a couple of, uh, employees, one or two and getting out there and doing, doing the work. But I didn't want to get back into the, the hassles of, human resources and managing people. And so for the entire time, I stayed as a uh, lone self-employed person, uh, no employees. Um, and, and and, uh, so I think you could uh, make a, a reasonable living at it, especially if you got uh, big enough about it and were young enough and ambitious enough to have a few additional employees uh, uh, to have a few employees beside yourself, uh, then you could uh, do very well, I think. So what would you have done if you had wanted to? It sounds like just kind of organically you started getting a pretty decent book of business. What would you have done to kind of increase your number of customers? Well, uh, advertising would, would have definitely uh, helped, uh, such as, going uh taking up a booth at a local home show which are held a couple of times a year in the vicinity uh perhaps expanding beyond the simple uh locale of the one town that i mainly worked in which was state college pennsylvania uh expanding to some of the other local towns although it is interesting in all the time uh that i did this work I never really got a call from any people in the uh, in the rural area. I think most of the people in the rural area have their own set of skills and and don't need uh, people like uh, like me, like a handyman, to come and help them out. But in state college, uh, in small towns where uh, maybe there's a wife at home or maybe maybe she's working too, uh, and the, both people have something else that they need to be uh, involved in and don't have the time or the skill to uh, do the kind of handyman work uh, that, that I was doing. Uh, so uh, I guess expanding the area, uh, going to trade shows, uh, even putting some, some flyers in uh, the newspaper. Uh, I, I started all of this before Craigslist became a big thing. And I think certainly uh, putting the free ads on Craigslist would have uh, would have expanded the business a bit because uh, uh, a lot of people are just, you know, using those free ads these days to uh, generate business. So Craigslist, um, would, uh, word of mouth seemed to be um, very effective for me uh, having met the people with the interior decorator, and that gave me access uh, to their home that is meeting them. And so they, they immediately would feel comfortable because they ha had this uh, professional interior decorator and me 
as the assistant coming in there to install things. And so immediately there was a bond of trust. Uh, and also, you know, having been a professional myself, it was easy for me to talk with other people who are also professionals and needed some some uh, handyman work uh, as opposed to just being uh, kind of uh, uh, a little bit of a, a rougher kind of a guy. Uh, uh, but uh, I think anybody can do this kind of work uh, if you have the skills. You need the skills and a few basic tools and uh, uh, especially if if you have a, it's always said, a man with a pickup truck can always make a make a living. Uh, there's always somebody who needs something cleaned up or carried away or or brought to their house. Um, so, how did you deal with um, when you had to go buy materials for a job? Would you just yes. sort of charge that at cost, or would you add a markup to it? Well, you know that's interesting. Uh, I could have perhaps. Uh, first of all. Uh, I enjoyed going to Lowe's and Home Depot and other hardware or plumbing stores. And I never charged at all, even a penny for the time that I spent buying materials. So I never charged for the time I spent doing that, nor did I ever mark it up. As a matter of fact, I would even take the receipt from say Lowe's if I bought some uh, picture hanging equipment or uh something like that that was needed uh, maybe a small piece of sheetrock or something to patch a hole in a wall uh, and i would just in addition to my little bill that i would give the people the customer i would also attach the receipt and just list that as one of the items and i never marked it up but you could mark it up that would be fair uh i even let them get my uh my military discount at lowe's and home depot which knocked 10% off their cost as well uh, and didn't even mark that up. Uh, uh, so th that would be another source of income. Actually, the time, if you're a professional doing this for a living, uh, you would definitely want to charge for the time that you spent uh, getting the materials and bringing them. I never even charged for the time to get from my own home uh, to their uh, uh, house. So when I walked in the door, that was the beginning of the, the, the uh, timing. If I spent two hours there, uh, they owed me two hours times whatever the current rate was. Uh, one thing I did do was I used uh, double, uh, two, um, a duplicate type of, of uh, receipt a little, a little, uh, oh, what do they call it? A little, uh, a little, uh, a little book of, of papers uh, with itemized a little heading on it, uh, and I, it would make a carbon copy. So one copy for me, one copy for them. I still have all of those books. I filled up about ten or so of those books over the over the years, uh, and oh, I also got a uh, a little rubber stamp and i i'd stamp my name and address on the top of these little uh, uh sheets of paper that i handed the customer and i always people always paid me i never had to bill anybody they paid me uh, right away unless they weren't home and i I'd, I'd just leave the bill there and i'd get it in the mail a few days later so uh, i never had any trouble uh, collecting uh people paid me either right away on the spot or very soon afterwards. And I, I imagine if you had really been into it, you could have um, it, uh, you could have actually been more proactive about reaching out to people, right? Because you would just wait for the call. You would never just like call people up and say, "Hey, it's been three months. You got any projects? Or you got any needs around the house?" Yeah, that's right. Uh, and I never really uh, tried to work the network particularly. Uh, although I would say to someone. Uh, if you or your neighbors uh, ever need anything, just uh, here's my card, give me a call. But I never then pushed it uh, by calling them back and uh, seeing if they were ready to ha have anything done. Uh, now, so I think you had a, a very brief foray into 
YouTube, right? You want to talk about your your one YouTube video? <laughs> yes, that's a lot of fun. Uh, you were the photographer, uh, and it was all oh, about 10 years ago. It might even mean 15 years ago when we needed a uh, a new spray nozzle on the kitchen sink at the farmhouse that you are now living in, even at this moment. Uh, and uh, you took a video of me uh, taking the, the, the nozzle off, the spray nozzle, and uh, putting a new one on. And I became the leading, uh, per, the, the person with the most, uh, I'm always number one. If you, if you type in uh, kitchen spray nozzle, uh, at least I have been number one for a long time. I am currently at about 300,000 views. That's the only video we ever put up that you and I did. Uh, and people, if, ever since then, uh, I'm getting little pings on the computer when I look it up on my, uh, my inbox. Uh, there'll be another person has subscribed to you and made some comments. Uh, many of them, it's very interesting. People would say, thank you very much for showing me how to do this. There's actually a little secret in it. There's a little pin that you may not know about that has to be pulled out first before the nozzle will come off and you can put the new one on. Uh, so I'm number one, 300,000 hits. Just a, a, amazing that 300,000 people have looked at it and all of them are so grateful for having uh, seen that. Uh, some of them even comment, the most recent comment was, uh, you did a fine job on putting the nozzle in, but you really need a new sink. <laughs> it turns out, <laughs> I, just the other day I was looking at the sink, which used to be actually a sink and uh, dishwasher combination, and it was built in 1948. It's actually pretty worn out. I think all of the porcelain is worn off on the on the sink uh, uh, itself, and <laughs> black shows through. Uh, we do need a new sink over there uh, sooner or later. Uh, but uh, people are very happy to have seen that. Uh, it was it was posted under Bill the Handyman. I think is what we did it. Bill the Handyman dot. Uh, buildthehandyman.com was already taken by somebody else and we put it up as buildthehandyman.org or or some other little uh phrase at the end so well and so we'll, that was my yeah and we can include a link to that youtube video in the show notes Oh, good idea. Yes, that that is fun. <laughs> it shows me uh, a grizzled old guy working on the kitchen sink and people can see what I'm talking about when they say, geez, you really need to get a new sink, you know? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, please do that. So I'm, I'm curious, Dad, um, turning back to your yeah. professional career at ABB. Yeah. Um, you know, looking back on it, do you have any, any observations, any things that you would have maybe done differently in managing your career or anything that you're particularly proud about? Anything you want to share from, from that? Well, uh, there were a lot of highlights uh, after joining the company as uh, a, a PhD, brand new minted. I joined the uh, the physics department, which handles the reactor core, the actual interactions within the reactor uh, fuel uh, uh, of the neutrons and the uranium and so forth. Uh, and I'm over the years. Uh, moved into uh, other aspects of it, design of uh, the entire reactor plant. I became a project manager for, I believe it's still the largest nuclear reactor facility in the world, which is three large nuclear reactors all clustered together in the middle of Arizona, uh, by Arizona Public Service, I think it is. And they each produce... Uh, 1300 megawatts of electric each so that's three times 1300 uh megawatts of electric it would handle basically all of arizona and some of the near, near uh, surrounding states uh, 
supply. Uh, that was one big highlight. Uh, at the end, toward the end of my career, since nuclear reactor sales uh, of new reactors had dropped way off, uh, actually zero, after uh, Three Mile Island and eventually Chernobyl, uh, the last reactors that were sold uh, were, were started up in the 1980s. Uh, the company I worked for, and then eventually uh, ABB, which I also, which was, had bought a combustion engineering, uh, the biggest parts of the business by the late 80s and the 90s was replacing the fuel, which needs to be replaced every year or year and a half, and servicing the nuclear reactors by the companies that built the reactors typically get called in to work on things like the reactor itself, the steam generators, the pumps and valves and the electronics and so forth. So uh, uh, I, I got into that. And at the end, when I retired, I was the director of a department involved with designing uh, improvements in the nuclear fuel assembly, the uranium holding uh, fuel rods and the arrangement of that within the reactor. Uh, and uh, oh, I've traveled to foreign countries. I travel all over the US. I think I've been to all of the reactors that combustion engineering built in the US. Uh, total in the US, I think currently there are about a hundred and some nuclear reactors in the U.S. producing electricity. Combustion engineering had maybe oh one fourth of those as our design reactor, but we had reactors in other countries, and we were trying to sell fuel, uh, the fuel assemblies, to reactors built by other companies, such as Westinghouse, uh, which. They have reactors of the Westinghouse design. I've been to France. I've been to uh, Taiwan, uh, China, and uh, South Korea. Uh, when when we joined up with uh, ABB, I made good friendships. I had a lot of professional contacts with the nuclear engineers in that company, in the ABB company, which that branch of ABB is headquartered in. Sweden. And so uh, I met a lot of uh, Swedish engineers. Fortunately, they were all much, much better. At, <laughs> it's hard to say even the word better doesn't really uh, cover it. They could speak English, whereas I only knew a very few words that they taught me about uh, in Swedish, such as Merry Christmas, Good Yule. <laughs> uh, but uh, between and uh, so we would travel throughout Europe, uh, in Germany, Czechoslovakia. That was a thrill to go to Czechoslovakia after the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union and the, the hard control they kept, the Soviet Union kept over all of Eastern Europe to have opened up Eastern Europe and go to Czechoslovakia and see things that at one point uh, Americans would never have been allowed to get into, uh, reactors and uh, design facilities in uh, in the Czech Czechoslovakia actually saw at a distance uh, Vaclav Havel, the, at that time the uh, the president or premier of uh, of uh, the Czech Republic, I think it was by that time. Uh, so uh, a lot of highlights uh, and a lot of good times. One of the things uh, that they, for some reason. Uh, the company would send me and a couple of engineers on sales meetings to uh, a once a year convention that we had with all of our reactor customers that had purchased combustion engineering reactors. And I would give a, an update uh, on advances in uh, uh, fuel design or reactor uh, design at uh, meetings around the country at resorts typically. And so that was always a fun activity. Uh, so uh, it was good. I, I enjoyed nuclear engineering. Uh, uh, and uh, But 
uh, I'll tell you that uh, being self-employed as a handyman was a lot less uh, stressful. And uh, I really enjoyed the uh, in and out in one day and get the job over with and come home. Uh, so handyman was a lot of fun. Well, Dad, independent professional, thanks for joining today on the show. And uh, any listeners who want to uh, send a message to my dad, you can send it to me and I'll, I'll pass it on to him. Dad, thanks for joining. Yeah. Thank you. It's been fun, William. Bye.